go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Today we're going to be talking about uh, toxic masculinity versus virtuous masculinity. It's the feast day of uh, Saint or the solemnity of Saint Joseph today, and I thought... How apropos would it be to compare and contrast? And it just so happens there's an article out on Crisis Magazine called Go to Joseph by Michael Ippolito. I'm going to be sharing this article with you because I think it is it is very good. It's a good, clear contrast. It says, in a world full of disorder and noise, the young men of America should not embrace the false prophets of masculinity. Instead, on the feast day of the foster father of Jesus, they should seek to imitate the life and the work of St. Joseph. Yay and amen. Well said. More on that coming up at 14 past the hour. And then we're going to have a conversation with one of the descendants of Father Michael McGivney, who wrote a book about his story, how he received a miraculous healing from alcoholism and psychosis. It's a pretty powerful story, but um, I can relate a little bit. I, I had a miraculous encounter with the Lord and Savior in April of 2002 that saved my 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 life. It saved my marriage. It made it possible for my children to be born. It saved me from pornography addiction. And I say that most people don't understand what it what it's like to go from one moment addicted to the next moment not. But Joe McGivney does. We're going to talk to him about that at thirty past the hour. Everything we discuss, of course, is going to be in the show notes over at the station of the cross dot com forward me slash from pornography A-C-T. addiction. And I say- Let's pray. Let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Joseph was born in Bethlehem of the royal line of King David. Yet, true to his lifelong humility, he earned a living as a carpenter, and most likely moved to Nazareth to find work. The traditional accounts of Joseph and Mary's betrothal mention that Joseph's staff brought forth blossoms, like the flower from the root of Jesse as a sign that he, out of all other suitors, was divinely chosen to be the pure spouse of the Blessed Virgin. St. Jerome and others declare that St. Joseph was himself perfectly chaste and virginal his entire life. Scripture emphasizes that Jesus was perfectly obedient to Joseph, for despite his comparative inferiority to Our Lady and certainly to Our Lord, Joseph nonetheless possessed earthly authority over both as husband and foster father. His great humility in holding this glorious office is shown by the fact that he speaks not a single word in Scripture. Joseph died in the blessed company of Jesus and Mary sometime before the wedding at Cana, and is a great patron of holy deaths and departing souls. For the church's first millennium or so, St. Joseph was not celebrated with a universal feast, though he was certainly highly regarded. As particular devotion to Joseph slowly grew, eventually he was added to the general calendar, his feast gradually increased in rank, and he was finally named Patron of the Universal Church in the 19th century. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. Saint Joseph, pray for us. And now your headline news. Epic Times reports House may refer January 6th committee members for obstruction. Rep. Barry Loudermilk from, uh, from Georgia, rather, said in an interview last week, that he may refer former members of the House January the 6th Select Committee to the Department of Justice for prosecution after a report that the he commissioned found that its members allegedly hid information from the public. Some members of the subcommittee could face charges of hiding and destroying documents. The George lawmaker suggested that there are other options, though, including censuring and ethics referrals. 
LifeSite News reports Hong Kong's Cardinal Chow refuses to condemn new law, forcing priests to break the seal of confession. Cardinal Stephen Chow, who has called for the sinicization of the Catholic Church in Hong Kong following the mandate of the CCP, which is seeking to increase its control over the church there, has refused to oppose or condemn the new security law that would require priests to inform authorities when they hear in sacramental confession what the government deems a crime of treason. In a press statement over the matter, Cardinal Stephen Chow seems to think, quote, the legislation of the Article 23 will not alter the confidential nature of the confession, close quote. Yikes. Just the News reports Google helped to boost Obama, Clinton, presidential runs while censoring others. In a report by the Media Research Center, Google's influence over U.S. elections was meticulously documented, revealing a consistent pattern of interference that spans nearly two decades. The executive summary of the report did not mince words, quote, MRC researchers have found 41 times where Google interfered in elections over the last 16 years, and its impact has surged dramatically, making it ever more harmful to democracy. In every case, Google harmed the candidates, regardless of the party who threatened their left-wing candidate of choice, close quote. In, a, in 2008, Google appeared to select the radical young Barack Obama to help spur to victory over John McCain. Meanwhile, it suppressed the supporters of Hillary Clinton for censorship. Yikes, let that sink in. Anything change? No, not really. And those, those are your headline news. Hey, the gospel today comes to us from uh, Matthew 1, verses 16, verses 18 through 21 and 24a. Why don't they just go from... Anyway. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about when his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Ghost. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Ghost that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took his wife into his home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Haydock's Catholic com commentary today had a lot to say. St. Jerome says, now this is interesting. It's going gonna, it's gonna to trigger you a little bit. You're going to say, but, but, but I've heard. Anyway, St. Jerome says, when you hear the name of husband, do not from thence imagine them to be married, but remember the custom of the scriptures, according to which they are espoused only, are called husbands and wives. They who are espoused are only called husbands and wives. I think St. Jerome here is making a distinction of the fact that they were betrothed, but they yet didn't yet live together. But I know, I know, I know you're going to be like, Joe, I've heard so many homilies. You know, Deacon so-and-so said so-and-so. I know you, I know, I know. But St. Jerome said it. Anyway, the, there's also a lot of commentary on the word until. And you might have heard this in, in conversations you might have had with non-Catholics that tried to use similar verses to say, well, Mary had other children because it says until, right? Well, the commentary says, Thus, when it is said, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool, in Psalm 109, by no means signifies that after the subjection of his enemies, the Son of God is no longer to sit at the right hand of his Father. So in other words, Haydock's commentary points out that until has actually nothing to do with what comes after. It's all about the significance of what that moment means. It goes on to say, thus also in the language of Scripture, the word first begotten does not mean after whom others were born, but before whom no one was born, whether there were further issues or not. In other words, kids that come after, it, doesn't, it has nothing to do with that. And the reason is because the law required that a sacrifice should be offered for the firstborn, 
and that he should be redeemed very soon after his birth, nor did it allow the parents to wait and see if any other sons should be born. The first begotten was a significant position. It had nothing to do with siblings. It goes on, and Joseph, her husband, knowing her strict virtue, was surprised at their at her pregnancy. But being a just man and not willing to expose her by denouncing her or giving her a bill of divorce, he had a mind to dismiss her privately, committing the whole cause to God. Let us learn from Joseph to be ever tender of our neighbor's reputation and never to entertain any injurious thoughts or suspicions to his prejudice. I, of course, side with St. Thomas Aquinas and that, uh, you know, St. Joseph was a virtuous man, a holy man and a humble one. And he could not fathom the idea that he, of all men, might be the foster father of the word incarnate, of God who took upon flesh and dwelt among men, of the promised Messiah and of the virgin who was to be the mother of the promised Messiah. He knew what that meant. He got the weight of it, and he didn't feel up to the task. And so out of humility, he tried to quietly dismiss her, hoping that God would appoint someone more worthy to the cause. But God said, uh, no, I chose you. Now, it's time to be about the business. And that's exactly, exactly what we see happening in the gospel passages. So, If you are encountered by somebody who takes an opposite view or a different view, just say no. Sorry, St. Joseph is just too based. He's too uber chad, as the kids say. He's lit, no cap. You know what I'm saying? Go to St. Joseph. We're going to talk about that coming up after the break. But I'm going to share with you an article by Michael Ippolito over Crisis Magazine. Go to St. Joseph in comparing and contrasting toxic masculinity to virtuous masculinity. It's a lesson for all of us, especially you husbands and you fathers. It's next. We'll see you then. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with the descendant of Father Michael McGivney, blessed Michael McGivney. Joe McGivney's on the team. We're going to be talking about his story of uh, alcoholism and psychosis and how, through the intercession of blessed Michael McGivney, he was miraculously healed from that. It's going to be a fascinating story. Hope you'll stick around for that, especially if you know anybody who might suffer from one of those things. Might be a good conversation to share. That's coming up, of course. Hey, good news. I do have good news on occasion. And here is some good news. I just saw this. The Public Religion Research Institute American Values Atlas Survey. That's a mouthful, isn't it? It says uh, that 67% of Americans support homosexual marriage in 2023. But guess what? Here's the good news. Here's the kicker. This is a two-point decrease from 2022. So we're headed in the right direction. Just I I guess it's just a slow process. It's like molasses. You know, the struggle bus is real, but we need to push that number even further south. So let us pray for virtue. And speaking of virtue, let's talk about St. Joseph, my, uh, my, one of my patrons, whom I am named after. St. Joseph, pray for us. In fact, I, I go to St. Joseph every Sunday after Mass, and I ask for his intercession for me in, in particular, but also for my family. And I saw this article over Crisis Magazine uh, from Michael Ippolito, whom we have We have talked to you before. I found it fascinating because it makes some good, clear contrast between toxic masculinity and virtuous masculinity. It says, we cannot understate the current crisis facing young men in America. In the wake of the sexual and cultural revolutions, young men have been aimlessly drifting in an ever hostile culture. Fatherlessness, pornography, video games and drugs are just some of the problems facing men today. The men of the sexual revolution feel alone, isolated, clinging to anything that gives them a quick fix. As a young man born into a hypersexual culture, I relate to the struggles facing my generation. Men have forgotten how to be men, and the results speak for themselves. Yeah, these men are emasculated. As St. Thomas Aquinas would say in the Secunda, he would say, you know, when we shrink back from the arduous tasks that we are called to, we have become emasculated. We have become effeminate. And that is exactly where men are today. It goes on, what solution are we to give to these young men? Surely there are better answers than a 90-day get-rich-quick scheme or making your bed in the morning. Hey, do not underestimate the power of making your bed in the morning, all right? Make your bed. Make your bed. Did you make your bed? Go back and make your bed. 
In a world full of disorder and noise, the young men of America should not embrace the false prophets, the false prophets of masculinity. Instead, on the feast day of the foster father of Jesus, they should seek to imitate the life and the work of St. Joseph, the, the one incredible, the incredible St. Joseph. First, the young men must turn off the false prophets of masculinity. These are groups of men who, while acting as if they are opposed to the liberal culture, are just offshoots of that same culture. Let's begin with two famous or infamous false prophets, Andrew Tate and Costin Alamaru, known as the Bronze Age pervert, which, by the way, I didn't even know who this was until I read this article. And apparently, Trad Jack Burton, tweet in tow, uh, reads his books or something, knows all about the guy. Uh, do you, does he have a tattoo of him? I don't even know. We should find out in the after show. He goes on. The red pill style of masculinity believes that the world is against men in marriage, in divorce courts, in popular media, and most especially in daily interactions with women. While the diagnosis may be accurate in certain areas, the prescription is worse than the cure. The solution to problems such as injustices in divorce courts or promiscuity among among women is to never marry and sleep with as many women as possible. How this makes sense is beyond me. According to the Red Pillars, men should not be focused on getting married or having families and should focus on the hustle and the grind set. It is a cowardly perspective that does not lead men to masculinity but to resentment and anger. And I just kind of want to point out that grind set, you know, the hustle hard culture. <sighs> There's an, an entire industry based on it. And that is as much of a danger to virtuous masculinity as, is, uh, as toxic masculinity is. Andrew Tate, the Muslim pimp, and his Hustlers Academy is nothing more than a shallow and material scam meant to drag down vulnerable and impressionable young men. The top G claims to be a hero fighting against the Matrix that, for some reason, is afraid of the former kickboxer. Ironically, Tate's solution to combating the Matrix keeps men trapped in the same Matrix. Tate's solution to a world of promiscuity and materialism is for men to be promiscuous and materially focused. Oh, and can we just point out that Andrew Tate abandoned uh, the Christian faith for Islam? How do you leave, leave the actual one religion God established for mankind for a fake one, for a false one? I'm just curious. And you expect that people are going to believe anything else you might have to say? Ask him for a friend. It goes on, Tate and his red pill followers are nothing more than wolves in sheep's clothing, bringing men toward a more vicious and prideful life. Following Tate comes Bap. That's the Bronze Age pervert, apparently. The top neo-pagan on the right, Bap, and his gang of Bapists promote a Nietzschean right view of politics where men should be focused on achieving the will to power. This will to power is to be done by embracing the Homeric virtues and rejecting the weakness and cowardice of Christianity. Just like pagans of old, Bap, just like pagans of old, Bap and his crew point to Christianity for the decline of the West, and thus the Bronze Age mindset is the political vision that can save the West. The rise of paganism again? Hmm. Sounds interesting and eerily similar to Daniel's prophecy of the end times. He goes on. Bap's philosophy, similar to, the, to that of Red Pillars, is vicious and material. Besides focusing on the will to power and poorly interpreting Plato, Bap promotes his philosophy behind thousands of levels of irony, bodybuilding aesthetics, poor grammar, and for some reason, soft core homoerotic pornography. It rejects the role of masculinity in becoming a father, having a family, and worshiping God. Instead, it focuses on an immature view of strength and power, like Tate Bap is another wolf in sheep's clothing that leads more men away from the truth and towards their base appetites. Both the Red Pillars and the Bapists are not the solution to the masculinity crisis. They are a part of the problem. As Luca Adamo wrote in the American Post Liberal, Andrew Tate and company are certainly not lefties, but they are not conservatives either. 
Our flock has been infiltrated by wolves who peddle a life of strain, pain, and empty promises. While these crowds may be accurate in their diagnosis of society, they are nevertheless contributing to the decline of American men. True masculinity is not what these false prophets promote. Masculinity can be reduced to vain materialism or cannot be reduced to vain materialism, such as working out or being powerful. That is a childish way to view masculinity. True masculinity comes from humility. It is not found in the flash and pomp of 1990s bodybuilders, but in the spiritual humility of Christ. The Catholic Church can provide the antidote to the spiritual poison our culture is ingesting. Young men must go to St. Joseph. St. Joseph, the most chaste spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary, is the perfect model for our confused young men to look up to. Though many would say that St. Joseph did not lead a glamorous life, he had one of the most critical roles in salvation history. St. Joseph was always just a bit holy, was always just a just, well, let me start over. St. Joseph was always a just and holy man. Initially, when he was informed that the Blessed Virgin was with child by the Holy Ghost, he felt unworthy to care for the Son of God, which is one explanation for why he sought to divorce her quietly. But when the angel Gabriel visited him, he recognized his responsibility to care for the Son of God. It seems like Michael Ippolito is on Team St. Thomas Aquinas too for St. Joseph. So all I'm saying is jump on board, get on the uh, the, the Thomas Aquinas train here. St. Joseph was just, he was a holy man, but he was a humble man, and he did not think himself up to the task, but God did. And we got to believe when God believes in us. St. Joseph protected, it goes on to say, and cared for the Blessed Virgin and the infant Jesus through all trials and adversities, whether finding a place for the Lord to be born, protecting the Holy Family during the flight into Egypt, or providing for them through his work. St. Joseph demonstrates numerous times the example of Christian masculinity. St. Joseph did not work for his own glory, but for the glory of others. He sacrificed much to please the will of God, and allow salvation history to be completed. St. Joseph understood the divine mission that his foster son would complete, and with, uh, without, with outstanding obedience, he raised and protected the Son of God. St. Joseph spoke no words in the gospel, but he did not need to. His actions spoke louder than anything he could have said. Today, As young men are lost and confused, it is a time for them to turn to St. Joseph. The earthly father of Jesus wants to protect all members of the mystical body of Christ, as he did while Christ was an infant. St. Joseph wants to be the father figure to all young men who feel hopeless and alone. Begin taking your responsibility as a man seriously and work towards your salvation as St. Joseph did. As Catholics, we have a greater responsibility to serve as a model of virtue since we have the knowledge of the fullness of truth on our side, unlike Andrew Tate or Bath or many others. As St. Paul wrote, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, not what he has proclaimed with his mouth, but how he lived that proclamation through his life, the deeds, his works. On this celebration of the Feast of St. Joseph, let all young men find virtue and comfort in the paternal love of radiating from his loving heart. Do not be fooled by this false masculinity of the world. Seek instead the true masculine example of St. Joseph. As the venerable Pope Pius XII said, If you wish to be close to Christ, we again repeat, go to St. Joseph. St. Joseph, pray for us. By Michael Ippolito over Crisis Magazine, go to Joseph. We're going to link to it in the show notes today for you. Praise be to God. But St. Joseph, and can I just recommend, if you have not done so already, you have time this Lent still. There's still time on the clock. Go and look up the visions of of the uh, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich on the life of the Holy Family. Pay close attention to St. Joseph in particular. In her visions, 
And I think uh, uh, in the city of God with Mother Greta, it's similar. St. Joseph was a holy and just man. You know what makes the difference between virtuous men and toxic men? Virtuous men do what is right. Virtuous men do what they are called to do. They are obedient to their state in life and to the will of God. Whatever, whatever God wants, that's what they want. Whatever God calls them to, that is what they are willing to do. Whatever it takes, they're willing to pay that price to sacrifice it all for the will of God to accomplish the mission that he has set them upon. Adam failed in this mission when he allowed Eve to do all the talking to the great dragon. St. Joseph stood in the gap. Let us be more like St. Joseph today and encourage our friends and family to do similar. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. What you're offering and giving to me, you deserve to get back because you're offering more than I can give. I learned so much through the station on the cross. I listen to the radio station daily, and I absolutely love it. I was attending the chapel and places like that, and through your programs, I was able to find out how other Protestants had come back into the Catholic Church. God bless the Station of the Cross. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. The Blaze reports mystery drones circled around Langley Air Force Base for weeks back in December. While the U.S. Air Force confirmed these incidents, it is still uncertain who owned the drones and why they appeared to be monitoring the base. The drones were first identified on December the 6th, and authorities became so concerned about the situation that they deployed advanced assets, including one of NASA's WB-57F high-flying research planes. A spokesperson for Langley said that none of the incursions appeared to exhibit hostile intent, but anything flying in our restricted airspace can pose a threat to flight safety. Just the news reports, Walgreens and CVS began rollout of abortion pill Mephepristone. Walgreens and CVS are rolling out the abortifacient Mephepristone in states where abortion is legal. Walgreens said last week that it's selling the drugs in locations in New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, California, and Illinois. Well, CVS said last week it's dispensing the drug in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. The FDA announced last year that Mephepristone could be sold at major pharmacy chains with a prescription. Let's pray that abortion comes to an end and all these drugs go away. The Pillar reports the USCCB mandates political correct passion disclaimer in bulletin inserts. The USCCB announced recently that it will require a pastoral note on anti-Semitism to be placed in worship aids and pew missiles ahead of all Good Friday Passion narratives beginning this year. The new requirement was announced last year in a memo from the heads of the USCCB Committee on Divine Worship and Ecumenical Interreligious Affairs to publishers of missiles and worship aids. The goal of the statement, the newsletter said, is, quote, to help ensure that the proclamation of the Lord's Passion is not misused to promote anti-Jewish sentiment, close quote. Let's pray for the complete conversion of all Jews to the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. And those, those are your headline news. Hey, uh, Joe McGivney is joining us right now. He has a book out, and um, it's called Your Miracle by My Story of Alcoholism, Miraculous Healing, and God's Infinite Power and Love. We're going to be linking to this Your A Miracle book in the show notes today over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Joe McGivney, good morning to you. Thanks for your time today. Good morning, Joe. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of your program today. I appreciate it. So I'm fascinated that you're related to Father Michael McGivney, but um, I'm also, what also caught me uh, about your story, and I've seen you've done lots of interviews, praise be to God, so I was able to have a great opportunity to get to know your story a bit. And there's one aspect about your story that I completely relate to. I had a mystical encounter with the Lord and Savior Jesus back in 2002 that saved me from addiction to pornography. It saved my marriage. It allowed my children to be born. And uh, by the glory of God, I'm sitting here today as a result to it. But when I talk about that story, what most people can't relate to is that one instant you're you're an addict and the next instant you're not. 
When you say that, people act like you're crazy. They don't understand it. There is a miracle that's happened in your life that seems very similar to what I experienced, only in your case, it's with alcoholism and psychosis, which is utterly fascinating. So I want to start there and just say uh, I can relate to your story in a big way, but maybe you can, because of time's sake, here quickly share with us how in the world did you ever become an alcoholic? What was that? What was the impetus that led you to to alcoholism? Yeah, my uh, <clears throat> my alcoholism and my frankly my love affair with with alcohol and drinking began when I was twelve years old. I was uh, I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago in a predominantly Irish Catholic neighborhood, and you know it was not uncommon for for young guy young kids. I was a kid really um, to start drinking, and I'll never forget that first night. I was um, you know out in the front yard of one of my friend's homes. His brother came out on his way to the liquor store, and we asked him to get us some beer, and he and he agreed. He came back. Mm. And at that point in my life, um, I was really filled with a lot of anxiety and fear. Um, even though I was a good student, I didn't think I was good enough. Uh, I was a good athlete, but again, didn't feel I was good enough. Um, I just had this sense of, you know, you know lack of self, self-worth, self I guess. Mm. And that first mm-hmm. night when I choked down three beers um all of those fears and anxieties and feelings of being less than just drifted away and the following morning i woke up with my first ever hangover and i think most people would have said you know waking up with that pounding headache saying gosh i'm never going to do that again my, my i was thinking the exact opposite i was thinking and obsessing about when can i do this again yeah. That's how good it yeah. So what was the worst part? What was like the bottom of the barrel? How bad did your life get as a result to your your ongoing addiction to alcohol? Yeah, my my bottom um really occurred during COVID. Uh you know, it was early March of 2020 and at that point, you know, when we went into complete lockdown, the the firm I worked for shut every office you know, on 40 countries, I think. And wow. long story short, wow. you know, my fears about my, you know, financial stability, my health, my family's health, you know, I had one child in college, one on the way, um, you know, and like most people, I had car payments and mortgages and college tuitions to pay for. And those those fears and anxieties just really took over my life and my, my solution was to just make sure that I had vodka running through my body and my brain every waking moment of every single day. Mm. Until, uh, mm. So from early March until December 30th, when my life completely changed. Wow. So wow. broken marriages, <clears throat> broken relationships, and uh, but, but the whole time you oh. sound like you were functioning anyway, like you were still a, fu- you were still, you were employed, gainfully employed. So you know, somehow, some way you were able to work this addiction into your life that although it was having its devastating effects, you, you kept, you were able to keep going. I was, yeah, I was, you know, what some refer to as a highly functioning alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, mm-hmm. I had a very successful career and still do in the investment industry. Um, I, you know, we had all the trappings of wealth and happiness, you know, big house, fancy cars, over the top vacations, private schools, mm-hmm. um, you know, so from the outside looking in, everyone, you know, would, I think would come to the conclusion that, wow, this guy's got it going on. Yeah. But it was nothing yeah. could be been further from the truth. I had this kind of hole in my soul and in my heart that, you know, again, those feelings of less than and that I didn't deserve what I had worked for. And again, my solution was alcohol. Mm. So you you went through one broken marriage. You're in a second marriage. But then things kind of take a turn for the worse. And you have a medical issue that leads you into the psych ward. Tell me about that. Sure. So <clears throat> on December 30th of 2020, um, after months of drinking during COVID throughout the day, my body completely collapsed and gave out. 
Um, my wife, Nicole, who happened to be upstairs sleeping with her uh, grace of God, her phone was nearby. And I have no memory of what happened in, during this period of my life. But what Nicole tells me happened is I called her, um, told her something's wrong. She rushed downstairs to find me on the living room floor, unable to even pick myself up. I wow. was speaking in gibberish. Wow. Um, and she rushed me to the first of the three hospitals that I would end up in. So over the following nine weeks, my came to learn that my brain had rewired into this horrific neurological condition called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. But I uh, ultimately, when I was locked up in a psych ward, I had an advanced stage of Korsakoff psychosis. I wow. was hallucinating. Wow. I didn't recognize my family. I didn't recognize anybody. I had no mem- no ability to even form memories, kind of like Groundhog Day. Wow. And I, my family was told that I would be that way for the rest of my life. There, There is no such thing as healing from Korsakoff psychosis. And after a nine-week period, transferred me from the psych ward into a treatment facility that uh, Nicole had found that agreed to hold me for 30 days so she could find my forever home. Mm. And they put me to bed Mm. on March 5th. I woke up the morning of March 6th completely 100% healed with no physical, psychological, cognitive deficits of any kind. That's amazing. Praise be to God. Amen. So do you, you don't remember that incident then? You don't recall that moment, that miraculous moment. You have no memory of it. No memory at all. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Blank in my memory that goes back to early November of 2020. So, um, you know, it was roughly a year of memories that just have been wiped clean. The only thing I remember from that period um is some of the hallucinations that I had during that period, which frankly are dark and violent and unspeakable. Um, and I think God I, maybe left I those have to believe. I have to believe that because of the choices that you had been making in life, the sinful choices, opening the way to the devil, the diabolic, that some of that had to have been diabolical oppression. Have you ever given any thought to that? I have given some thought to that. And, um, you know, part of, I think, well, you know, the, you know, when you really think it through, um, there's no question, I think, that had I not found God and had my family members not been praying for my inner, or for my healing, um, we, we wouldn't be sitting here today having this. Discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Praise be to God for those that see us in trouble and do something about it, right? They they, they don't just sit around Thank idle, you. but they're they're praying and asking for intercessory prayer. We're going to be up against a break here in just a moment. We're talking with Joe McGivney. He's got a book out, or uh, we're going to link to it. It's called You're a Miracle, My Story of Alcohol is a Miraculous Healing of God's Infinite Power and Love. You can find that on Amazon. Sophia is, is uh, also publishing or, or promoting this book. But we'll put a link to it at the, in the show notes over at the station of the cross dot com forward slash ACT. Uh, I want to save some for the after the break. But can you tell us because it's going to get in. We're going to get into it. But how are you related to uh, Blessed Father Michael McGivney? Um, I believe I, I would be considered a great grand nephew, maybe. Um, my great grandfather and Father Michael are believed to be second cousins. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, my great grandfather was born in a little village called Kilnalek, Kilnalek in County Cavan, Ireland. Mm. And Father McGivney's mm. dad was born in the neighboring village called Drum Killy. They are literally like separated by about two miles. Is that and, right? Um, <clears throat> the, the, the birth records and the genealogical records uh, from that time are pretty scarce. So we can't say with 100% certainty that we're related, but it's been part of family lore and tradition, you know, for as long as I can remember that, especially after Father Michael um, was raised up to venerable and there was a book that was written about his life. 
Um, yeah. You know, <clears throat> my family members were keenly aware of our connection, but at that point, frankly, I was so selfish. I really didn't care about that. It <laughs> wasn't even on my radar. Which is kind of what I want to talk about when we get to the other side of the break is your Catholic faith. You raised Catholic, but didn't practice the Catholic faith. Like so many, yeah, you've left, you walked away from the Catholic faith. I think it was around college time, if I, if I remember correctly, from your story. So I want to talk a little bit about that on the other side of the break as well. And uh, it's an opportunity. It's a teachable moment for us parents of kids that are going off to college. How do we help our children Live and stay in the faith instead of walk away from it in, in uh, traction to the lures of this world, the flesh and the devil. I think the story that Joe shares with us is a powerful one. We're going to be talking about the intercessory prayer of Blessed Father Michael McGivney in his life. And, uh, and for that, that's why he's sitting here. So that's a spoiler alert for you. But you can check out the book, You're a Miracle, My Story of Alcoholism, Miraculous Healing and God's Infinite Power and Love. It's sold on Amazon for sure. We're going to link to it at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. So all that plus the after show is still to come where you can hang out and talk with us directly. Whatever you want to talk about is on the agenda. That and more is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Joe McGivney is our guest. We're having a conversation about his life, his story, but um, he's got a book, You're a Miracle. We're going to link to it in the show notes for you. His life, uh, he says, My Story of Alcoholism, Miraculous Healing, and God's Infinite Power and Love. Joe McGivney, welcome back to the show. Thanks for your time today. Um, let's talk about Father Michael McGivney more and how he played a role in your in your miraculous healing. Again, I, I, I find that very few people can relate to to what you've experienced. I mean, I can't relate to what you've experienced even, but I have something similar, like I said at the beginning of our conversation. There was a moment I was addicted, and then there was a moment that I wasn't, and it was through the mir- miraculous healing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And uh, for, in your case, Father McGivney was, was recruited to pray and intercede for you. Tell us about that. How did that happen? How did that come about? Who was responsible for recruiting uh, one of your ancestors to uh, to pray and intercede on your behalf? Because certainly somebody in your life thought you were worth saving. Tell us about it. Sure. <clears throat> so when I went down for the, you know, and was admitted to the first hospital on December 30th of 2020, <clears throat> my wife got in, immediately got in touch with my aunt, Jerry. Uh, Jerry's a McGivney. She's my, fa- you know, my first aunt, my father's sister, and she's a nurse and a really good nurse. And Jerry kind of became the, in, in my medical advocate at that point where she would, you know, speak with the doc, the hospitals that I was in, the facilities I was in and relay what was going on to my wife, Nicole, to my father and to my family. Um, and as it turns out, my Aunt Jerry is also a very devout Catholic woman. And she, you know, like my entire family, was praying for me. So anyway, after I, that nine-week odyssey, I have this, you know, miraculous, spontaneous healing, which is completely unheard of. I always wondered why, you know, why did God choose to save my life the way he did? Um and remove all of my addictions. You know, I certainly wasn't the only one suffering from addiction or alcoholism or psychosis for that matter. So a few months later, I ended up joining the Knights of Columbus and I was having a phone call with my beloved aunt, Jerry, where I shared that with her. And I was expecting her to be really happy. And instead she started crying and and I, you know, around the phone, and I said, Jerry, what, what's going on? She said, Joey, you, you have no idea what, you know, how hard I was praying for you and your family was as well. She said, I prayed to anyone who'd listened to G. I I prayed to Jesus, to Mary, to God. She said, but I also fervently prayed to our relative, Father Michael. And in that moment, it, kind of all my questions of why God may have chosen to save me mm. um, 
I think the pieces all came together in that phone conversation. So there's, it's our belief that our relative, Father Michael's intercession, is very likely to be the reason that I've been fully healed, not only physically, but spiritually as well. That's amazing. Praise be to God for it. So you walked away from your Catholic faith, um, it, it probably because of uh, of alcoholism, but also, I would imagine, just the lure of the world, being a young man. And was this the moment that brings you back to the Catholic faith? It was uh, very close to it. Um, I had already, at that point, after my miraculous healing, when I got out of that treatment center that I that, that occurred in, um, I started to go into AA and working through the 12 steps. I came to learn that, you know, my drinking brought me to AA, but AA brought me to God. The entire 12 step program of AA is all about surrendering your life and your will to God's care. So if I was going to AA meetings and finally dawned on me, maybe it's time for me to go back to church. And frankly, I was a little terrified. I was a little scared and intimidated <laughs> because I had turned my back on the church decades before. <clears throat> and not not because I was angry, not because I, you know, didn't believe in my Catholic faith. I just was too selfish to care about. It. So ultimately, I made my way back to church, and it was right around this time of year, um, I think, where I the church I had started going to our the pastor was giving a homily, and he basically ended it with the message that um, heaven is not for the righteous and the good, that heaven is for the forgiven. And at that point, it was like a lightning bolt moment that said, you know, a sinner like me, a lost sheep like me, maybe this is exactly where I belong and exactly type it all, all the re- questions of why I, I was saved all again just became so crystal clear that you know, God's grace and mercy had brought me back not only yeah. healing me physically yeah. but healing me spiritually so hindsight being 2020 oh, and you. having a wonderful wonderful gift that, like you've experienced in your life of miraculous healing and restored Restored order in your life, restored order in your relationships, and and uh, and hopefully with your your children. I mean, I'm sure that was a rough ride that you probably only hint at in the book and et cetera. So, in hindsight, being 2020, what advice would you give to your to your younger self? I mean, how would you talk to parents whose kids are going off to college right now and they're stepping off on their own and they're going to be faced and surrounded by by the the world and all of its allurements? How would you encourage them to encourage their kids to maintain the faith? I would think, and I have two young adult children now myself. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I think the most important message you, you can give is, you know, especially I think for college age children is number one, you know, do your best to keep at least one foot in your faith. Mm. Um, you know, you're going to be, have temptations, you're going to be out socializing, you're going to have this newfound freedom, but hang on to your faith, uh, number one. But number two, always know that if you start to drift, if you start to do things that are sinful, know that you can always turn back to God and know that you can always turn back to our church. And for me, I know that I, I wish I had really thought that through when I was a young man because I completely, I, I thought it was an all or nothing battle, you know. I either yeah. was full on going to church every yeah. Sunday and praying every day and, or not. And I came to learn that it doesn't, it, it's not an all or nothing. The church and, and our faith will always be there for you. But mm. embrace the fact that the times you're going to face as you go and march through college and into your early adulthood, you know, take it from me. They'll be so much easier to navigate if you have your faith in your heart in the right place, which is in God's Amen. hand. Amen. Well said. Amen. Um, well said. Has it been has it been an awkward experience for you? Did you feel weird at all when you, like I said, when you went from that one moment addicted to one moment not? I know you don't remember the moment because of the psychosis and the alcoholism and all the rest, but 
uh, in the days and weeks that came after that in your recovery, did you feel like, was that a strange experience for you? Not having that draw towards the, towards that vodka anymore? Yes. Initially it was, um, uh, during that initial recovery period, I had to learn how to even just live each day yeah. without alcohol. Uh, it, 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 it was so much a part of my life for so many years that even though the cravings had been removed and I, I didn't have no longer obsessed about alcohol, I had to relearn how to behave in the normal world, you know, uh, yeah. without a drink in my hand. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was kind of foreign to me at that point. Yeah, I can relate. I can relate. I have I had similar experiences back in my day. I feel like an old man when I say that. Back in my day. Anyway, <laughs> Joe McGivney, <laughs> thanks for sharing your story with us today. Uh, praise be to God for those that loved you enough to pray and intercede for you and ask Father Michael McGivney to also intercede for you. I think it's an, a powerful message for all of us today. If you know someone struggling, get involved. Pray fast. Do penance. And ask the saints to do the same. St. Joe would be a wonderful person to go to. Joe McGivney, God bless you. God love you. We're going to link to your book in the show notes today. We'll see you guys in the after show. God bless. The Station of the Cross is brought to you in part by My Catholic Will. This Lent, consider making an act of charity by including the Station of the Cross in your will. We've partnered with My Catholic Will to make it easy and convenient to create your will, and it's free. Just use referral code 14 stations when you visit mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross. Again, that's mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. And yes, this time my mic is supposed to be on. And uh, uh, happy name day, Joe, by the so- way. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. St. Joe, pray for us. Amen. So what would be what is the what is the opposite of based? What would be the proper cringe lingo? What is it? Cringe. That's what the kids say? Yeah. If you're not they based, say cringe. if you're not based, you're cringe. So was it were you being cringe when you had hot mic? No, I think that was a pretty based? based. I think that was a pretty based hot mic because yeah, based we did, hot mic. We did we didn't go to break and then I was like, oh man, that stupid audience watching our show. We've got it. We've got it. The bull pulled over their eyes. Like no, it was just us. It was just us making fun of each other. <laughs> uh, one of these days, D-based. The, the, the hot D-based is Robert. Yeah, D-based. Yeah, D-based. The D-based. hot the hot mi- the hot mic was just uh, was just us being funny. So that's, that's <laughs> we're, we need to do an entire segment in the lingo of the kids uh, uh, someday. Oh, I'm going to need to script that out probably, but the whole thing, <laughs> just go to town, let it rip. Don't apologize. Hey, Jen, good morning to you. Nick, the mic is here. St. Joseph, Oro Pronobis. Damon, good morning to you. Trad Jack Burton, tweet in tow. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. I'm glad you're here. Sharon, good morning to you. <clears throat> Love those pictures this morning, Sharon. Of the parish in uh, in Florida. By the way, I may be in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, coming up in uh, in April. Looks like um, I may be giving a talk down there. Uh, praise be to God. Look, so I hope that works out, and that would be fun. I just found out about a, a village in Scotland called Lauderdale. I don't know if that's really? what it was named after, but I'd never heard of it. Tiny little village near where where a saint was uh, was born and was working. So yeah. That's super cool. I was going down the rabbit hole of McLean's and Scotland and all yeah. the rest over the weekend because I got my copy of Wilmer McLean, uh, the biography that I found when I went to visit the Appomattox Courthouse where General Lee surrendered to General Grant. So I was going through that. It was naming names. So I'm looking up names, trying to find, looking for patterns and all these, uh, all these uh, scallywag Scotsmen, uh, seafarers. <laughs> or it was anyway, that's a stra- rabbit hole for another day. Uh, I wasn't going to say, I forget what I was going to say. Um, there was something on my mind and now it's slipped my mind. I guess it'll come back to me. Struggle bus is real people all aboard. Get your tickets. Bus is leaving. James 16897. Good morning to you, my friend. Uh, Nick, the mic's also on rumble. Robert DeBruce is here. Sci-fi Lynn Pine. Good morning to you. Glad you guys are here today. Thanks for, for hanging out with us today. I see, um, my friend, Junior Barra. Good morning to you, Don Paddock, Lori. And Patty, Patty's from Connecticut. Who knew? I didn't know. That's amazing. Rebecca, 
A good morning to you. Glad you're here today. Thank you for doing it. Sean. Sean was pointing out the hot mic. Uh, everyone was. <laughs> yeah, everybody was. Pat. I had to respond good to it to every single platform. <laughs> Pola Chicho, my friend, mi amigo. Que tal? Good morning to you. Glad you're here today. Janice and Alberto. Gregory is on the team today. Glad you're here. Thanks for doing it. Liz Fench. Michael McDermott. Pittsburgh is on the team today. All right. <laughs> Pittsburgh is in the house. Pittsburgh police. What's going on? Uh, is it, I said Michael. Uh, forgive me. I met Michelle. Michelle. <laughs> I totally met Michelle. Struggle bus is real. I thought I was clear about that. Anyway, Michelle. Uh, what's going on with the Pittsburgh police? Like mm. they're they're just like closing up shop. It's just not. I mean, that's scary. Like you you need police. Chris Anderson. Hey y'all. I like that. Jackson. Good morning to you. Aitna Murphy. Maria, uh, Maria Lupini. Good morning to you. John. Good morning to you. Glad you're here. Colleen. Good morning to you. Robert Stevenson. Carl Thomas. Glad you guys are on the team today. Sharon's also here. Sounds cringe. Little Daisy's on the team. Good morning to you, little Daisy. Praise be to God. Uh, Moonbeam127, T. Miller. That's a mouthful. I'm going to be honest with you. That's like a lot to say. Moonbeam. I'm going to shorten it down to Moonbeam. Um, Good morning to you. KSB is here. Evelyn is here. Adam McHugh is here. Good morning to you. Kilroy Jones is on the team today. Glad to see it. Praise be to God. Aiden is back, our friend from Ireland. Alberto, our friend from the UK. Lee Aaron is here. Good morning to you. You know, Lee Aaron, your comment reminded me, you had a comment about what is he running from or reality. That reminded me, I was just recently watching Pints with Aquinas, and he was interviewing somebody whom I didn't know. Um, Some young whippersnapper. No idea. Probably had tattoos. I have no idea. Um. But good morning to you, Colleen. Edwin, good morning to you. Edwin, I have a grandson named Edwin. Edwin, I always say Edwin. Anyway, um, (laughs) Linda, I'm rabbit holes here big time. Linda, good morning to you from Richmond, Virginia. Praise be to God. Wilmer lived in Richmond for a little bit. Anyway, um, what was I saying? (laughs) The struggle. Someone someone was interviewing a young guy. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Good I've night, been, everybody. I've, I've, Good been, night. I've been there, too. Yeah. That's fine. No, the struggle bus is ridiculous right now. Anyway, uh, Pints with Aquinas. Pints with Aquinas was, was interviewing some whippersnapper, and um, they were talking about drugs. And I think it was, they were talking about, like, um, the guest was saying that when he was a kid, he was never really attracted to drugs. He had other issues, but not that one. And Matt Frad kind of related to him. And he was just, you know, talking about that a little bit. And they were saying, you know, these drugs that separate us from reality, like they, they, that, and that's part of your, your self medicating to deal with your reality. You know, the difference between coffee and marijuana is coffee helps me get in tune with reality. Marijuana takes me away <laughs> from reality. That was the point that they were making. I thought it was an excellent point, by the way. You know, and it's, and again, whenever I, I, I got interviewed by the national Catholic register 15 years ago, at least 15 years ago, I don't know, 2009 ish, somewhere in that vicinity. And they were asking me, cause I had been, uh, Matt Fried included me in delivered. I'm the first chapter of chapter of the book delivered published by Catholic answers, which was published eons ago now. But, um, the National Catholic Register interviewed me and in, about my 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 story on pornography addiction. And when I said to them, "I'm not an addict," they were like, "Well, that's weird. Once an addict, always an addict." And I'm like, "No, I don't believe in that." What do you mean you don't believe in that? You have to believe in that. Everybody believes in this. You have to. And I'm like, "No, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't, I don't buy that. Why not? Because who I am is not an addict. Who I am is a son of the Most High God." And when I fail and I fall, I have access and recourse to grace, the sacrament of confession, and the Holy Eucharist, prayer, fasting, and penance. So who I am uh, doesn't change. The sins that I commit are obviously an issue and have to be dealt with, but who I am doesn't change. That's, That's number one. And so, and I felt like there was a crisis of identity wrapped up 
in the conversation around addiction. And I, I published uh, I published an article that eventually found its way into becoming, you know, my book and my conversion story and all the rest. And on I, I found a picture, and I'm sure it's still on my I have an old website called CatholicHack.com. I don't update it. I haven't in years. But I still pay for it every year, so it's still there. All my old content is still there. Anyway, um, there is a, a picture that I found way back in the day, and I used it for my blog post to try to talk about the subject. And it was the picture of a tank that had a church on top of it. <laughs> you know, And it was to illustrate that we – that we are the church militant and we have we are in the combat we are in the in combat for for souls combat for our soul and the souls of those that whom god places in our care and custody and i talked about this crisis of identity and you know we we are told that we have to be this kind of person or that like i'm a trad catholic or i'm a liberal catholic a modernist catholic or i'm a i'm a liberal i'm a democrat or i'm a republican or i'm a i'm a this i'm a that i have preferred pronouns. I have all, all of this stuff in life. I'm an alcoholic. No, I'm a son of the most high God. That's who I am. I'm a son of the most high God. I am Catholic. Let the chips fall where they may. So there was a crisis of identity that I recognized in my own story that I tried to share with others. Now I'm not, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak on, um, on like alcoholic anonymous and things like that. I'm, there's some good value there, to be sure. But I think if we can remind ourselves of who we are when we're in crisis mode, I think that'll go a long way. But it is really difficult to explain to people how one moment I'm addicted and the next moment I'm not. It is bizarre. It is, it, and, and I can relate to Joe McGivney, what he said about the days and the weeks after, about having to like figure that part out. Because in the days and weeks after my mystical encounter with Jesus Christ in 2002, I knew that I could not, for the first time in 21 years at that point in my life, the first time in 21 years of being addicted to pornography and masturbation and all the rest, that I knew that I couldn't do that anymore. Like, that was bizarre. I knew I couldn't. I didn't know why. It was bizarre. And I didn't have, I didn't have the resources to, to understand. I just knew intuitively at that point that I could not anymore abuse myself or abuse others sexually. I couldn't watch pornography anymore. And that was an, in, an, an intuition in my mind, in my heart, that I couldn't explain. And um, I remember I would be around, I'd be around women, strangers, that I would have nothing to do with, no interaction whatsoever, they weren't in any way trying to attract me or manipulate me in any way. They were just going about their lives as normal. No connection whatsoever. And I would break out into cold sweats in a mortal combat for my soul. Because for 21 years prior to that moment, I would certainly just in, indulge into the, the fantasy in the minds. I had put so much, I had put so much junk up there, pornography, illicit sexual relationships, et cetera, in my mind that I could fantasize for days with what's just in the mind, let alone adding anything new to it. So, but I knew intuitively in, a, after that moment that that fight must happen and it must be a fight to the death. But I didn't understand why. I had did not have the resources, which is why I, I'm not peddling my book. Do not, you don't need to buy my book. There's a thousand books written way better than mine. Don't bother. I'm just trying to point out that this is why I wrote, wrote my book was because I could tell you the story, but there was so much more meat on the bone that's left off. If I just tell you my journey story, my witness story, and I don't give you the meat on the bone. And that's why I wrote this. And I wrote it for knuckleheads. I wrote it for knuckle draggers who don't want to read. I used huge font. So you have no excuse and you can read quickly and get to the, just the facts, ma'am, and give you what you need fast. And there's a whole section on there on retraining the mind and, uh, and re-educating yourself. And I had to go through all that process. And for me, when I discovered Theology of the Body, I was angry. I was angry over Theology of the Body. Now, some trads don't like Theology of the Body. Listen, trust me when I tell you that there's some great fruit there. 
that can be abused by so many in the church today, and they ought not to be doing that. But the but that fruit ought not to be um, cast off just because that some abuse it. Uh, I was I was angry because for the first time in my life, I saw that there was a dignity to the human sexual gift. No one, no one in my entire life did ever bother to tell me that. I was fed pornography as a little boy. I grew up on it, had my own collection, shared it with others. I thought that was normal. I thought that was real. I thought that was okay. I thought that was acceptable. I thought that was, was what was desired. And when I discovered that that was a lie straight from the pit of hell, I was angry. Literally. I'm like, where was my Sunday school teachers? I went to Sunday school. I went to the Church of Christ. I'm talking a cappella, no instrument Church of Christ, red brick Church of Christ. Where in the world was the person to tell me that the gift of human sexuality was a gift from God, that it wasn't, it wasn't dirty, it was sacred, it was holy, and should be treated with reverence, put in its, uh, in its proper uh, place. No one told me that. You know, and, and it's interesting because the devil will make you believe that it's the church that's prudish. The church, the church is a prude, they'll say. The church is, uh, is, hates sex, thinks sex is dirty, but it's the actual opposite that's true. The church does, church believes sex is holy. Church believes sex is good. It's great. It's wonderful between a man and a woman in the sacrament of marriage that bears fruit and bears life. It is a total gift of self, one to the other. And the two become one, and they form a bond, a bond so real that, as uh, as the great uh, Dr. Scott Hahn would say, that nine months later, you had to give it a name. I always loved that line. That was such a good line. So good. But I was angry for a long time over that. So that's what I, t- I – in this book, it's not just my story. I actually include the chapter in the appendix – from uh, from delivered that Matt Frad put together, but anyway, I saw them talking about that. Uh, Matt Frad uh, talking about these drugs to go back to that, and I totally related. So much of what we do is to me- self medicate because we are struggling with the reality of life. And anything you do, any habit, any behavior in your life that's trying to take you away from reality in an unhealthy way needs to be dealt with. You need to cut it out of your life. Coffee helps me to get greater in tune with reality. (sighs) Vodka, marijuana, pornography, and many, many other things could take you away. It's true. Sharon says, Joe's witness has made a difference in my life. Look at me hanging out with all of you uh, like-minded people. (laughs) Praise be to God. Sharon, you weren't clear on whether that was a uh, a positive or a negative difference. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, truth 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 bombs truth bombs today chris anderson amen joe i agree with you i've been uh, sober for 21 years i got on my knees in jail and asked god and asked god to take away my desire to drink and be in charge of my life i have not craved alcohol at all yay and amen chris anderson i love that praise be to god deo gracias that is an amazing an amazing testimony thank you for it um, Colleen says, I will totally buy it. Don't buy my book. I was not trying to pitch my book. I was simply trying to make the point, but you are very gracious indeed. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you wrote it and love theology, the body JP too. I wish I could have found someone that valued it as well. It's, uh, I have, I have been greatly blessed by it to, to say the least, to say the least. John, John says, Theology of the Body is the worst Billy Idol album. <laughs> Billy I thought Idol. that was funny. Oh, man. That, I just. Is that why, is that why White Wedding was actually White Wedding Part One and Theology of the Body is White Wedding oh, Part Two? There we go. I just had flashbacks to Billy Idol. I'm thinking about it. When, remember when MTV. I was without a face. Remember? Right I was there when MTV launched. I remember the day. With the astronaut on the moon with the flag. Oh, yeah. I want my. MTV. I want my MTV. How's it go? I don't know. That's that's how it goes. That's how it goes. Look at them <laughs> yo-yo. That's the way you do it. Oh man, Billy Play Idol. Whatever, guitar, whatever happened to Billy Idol? I don't know. I wonder if he's still around playing. Maybe he's doing Smiths covers like uh, what's his face? Um, uh, Rick Astley. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I wonder if he's still around. Yeah. In, in flashback vh1 <laughs> who remembers vh1 remember when they used the to play music yeah 
I got to say, um, I don't watch MTV. I haven't watched MTV in, in forever. Boy, yes, the, that was an animated video. Yeah, Damon, that, that you was just like reminded me. That was like me. the first computer animated music video. Like a century before there was Toy Story, there was the video for I Want My MTV. You just thanks for posting that. I'm just having super flashbacks right now. Money for nothing and the chicks. Yo, and how's it go? You what? I'm sorry. Money mm-hmm. for nothing and the chicks for free. Of Karen course, that was Eddie, di- that was Dire Straits, not Billy. That Eddie, was Dire so, Straits, yeah. yes. So, be, not and not what's his name? Not but Billy. Nonetheless, Eddie. not Billy. <laughs> I, I can remember the day. I think crazy. they do still have MTV Deborah Saints, and I I don't think there's any music or music videos on it. At all, I I haven't something. watched it in forever. No, I mean, me r- literally, I don't follow anything on MTV. I don't, I don't have, have not cable. <laughs> ma- well over a decade, but I got to say, I used to love. One thing I did love about it was um, the acoustic set. Like they get these bands in to do acoustic Those covers. Were good. Of their there, sh- there was there was good stuff. I love the acoustic set, man. I love the acoustic guitars. One of my favorite instruments. Absolutely love it. Uh, by the way. Uh, Rebecca, good morning to you. So, Joe, I loved and appreciated your movie about your father wound. Uh, thank you for your powerful testimony. God bless you and your beautiful family. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. God love you. I appreciate you uh, you saying that. Uh, Karen Eddie Bashaw says, my own use of alcohol was okay in my mind because I saw it growing up. My father drank every night a six-pack of beer and other types of alcohol. I was brought to Sunday Mass every week, but never saw either a parent go to confession or receive communion. Uh, well, at least they didn't go to communion. I'll give, it to, I'll give that to them. They knew that they weren't living right, so they didn't present themselves to communion. There's something to that, right? There's a seed there. I was enrolled in Sunday Catholic classes, did my first penance and communion. As the years went by, I got further away from the church. I tried raising my children by taking them to church, but I never had my younger two baptized. Ooh, ouch. My first husband wasn't Catholic, so we didn't marry in the church. I've been trying to get back to the church. Radio shows like this are helping me. Well, we are glad you are on the team. Karen E. Bishaw, be assured of our prayers for you and for you and for your family, for your journey. And uh, there, are some, there are some seeds there. The journey is real. God does not abandon us just because we fall we fall short of what he has asked us and give, uh, called us to, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the good part of the story. You know, I, I, I have often thought back, hindsight being 2020, and seen how God was with me along the journey and all the terrible decisions that I've, that I've made in life. And in spite of it all, God was there. He wasn't approving of any of my choices. He allowed me to make these terrible choices and suffer the consequences of them because I'm a because you make your bed, you lie in it. But at the same time, I could see how he was still there present along the way. I had I had these mystical moments in my life, even prior to 2002. The first time I saw my wife, I heard I had like an interior locution that she is the one. It was at a pizza joint. Bertucci's Bar and Grill, which has now since been closed, I've heard, in Nashua, New Hampshire. I was uh, I was hawking pizzas on the radio live from a sponsor's uh, location. And um, she walked in the room. This is the one I prepared for you. You don't hear that every day. <laughs> you know, that, that's not something a, a porn addict, you know, really hears every day. So, I mean, I, I had a lot of moments like that. I've shared many of those here before with you guys, but uh, I've had, you know, I could just see it along the way. Like, no matter no matter the knucklehead moves I was making, God did not abandon me. He's not abandoning you, Karen, as well. And I think there's something to that seed planted in your parents' hearts that they knew, that they knew. That they, and if they know, then there's still hope, right? And there's still hope. I'm glad you shared that with us today. Thank you for doing that. Joe, um, I did have something to share about the uh, – in regards to the second segment before the guest hey. segment. All right. So I, full disclosure, as a Catholic, I'm still a, a pretty big fan of C.S. Lewis. I like a lot of the stuff he writes, <sighs> even if he's All not, right, guys. It was never, a great show. Thanks never for coming quite, today, but – May have not are, made it home at the end. I mean, who, who knows? Who knows what, what happened what? at the very end? But Who lets Jake in the room every day? I mean, C.S. Lewis? Come on. So does he I'm, even wear? I, does he even wear wool? I know that I, might I get my, my cranky trad card uh, canceled. That I, I'm enjoying <laughs> something that's not, you know, rad trad. Uh, All was, right, further up and further in. Go ahead. Anyway, ah, very, yeah, right. Um, but 
so this is this I always thought was a an interesting point he made. Um, it's not, and I think it's it's good to take into account this uh, this concept, um, even if it's not exactly he's he's not necessarily endorsing this. But basically, he says, um, uh, this is in a letter from the, uh, 1953. Um, Certainly, I feel that very grave dangers hang over us. This results from the apostasy of the great part of Europe from the Christian faith. Hence, a worse state than the one we were in before we received the faith. For no one returns from Christianity to the same state he was in before Christianity, but into a worse state. The difference between a pagan and an apostate is the difference between an unmarried woman and an adulteress. For faith perfects nature, but faith lost corrupts nature. Therefore, many men of our time have lost not only the supernatural light, but also the natural light which pagans possessed. Um... And he does make us, uh, and then he goes on, where is this here? Um, Yes, it is necessary to recall many to the law of nature before we talk about God. For Christ promises forgiveness of sins, but what is that to those who, since they do not know the law of nature, do not know that they have sinned? Moral relativity is the enemy we have to overcome before we tackle atheism. I would almost dare to say, first let us make the younger generation good pagans, and afterwards let us make them Christians. Now, he does say, I would almost dare to say, he's not actually saying that. And that's where, but I thought that related well to what uh, Michael Ippolito was saying, where that, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some accurate diagnosis going on here with the kind of, uh, you know, gynocratic world we live in today. But they're giving you a, 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 a liberal solution to it that will yeah. just go down the same wrong path again. And, but... But also there's still a point to, oh, we have to reclaim, you know, at least the pagans, when the church encountered them in northern Europe and everything, they had certain natural virtues. Rome had certain natural virtues in place, and then it needed Christ to come and perfect it. But you can't go back to that once you have Christianity, once you have Christ, because you're, just, you're, you're, you're giving up the greater good to try and get back to this thing. So you're, you're, you're pursuing completely the wrong, the wrong path. But it reminded me when he started talking about that. It reminded me of this quote because mm-hmm. I, I always thought of this in in comparison to uh, you know to BAP and and everything. I actually own BAP's book. I bought it when it first came out. <laughs> really? To, to check it out? Yeah. Back when wow. it was back when it was the hot new thing in like 2015, thing. 2016. The hot new. I thing never on the, even on the right. heard of the dude. Yeah, I'm like, where and, have I been? And there's some interesting stuff rock, in there. Apparently, there's some interesting stuff in there because it's you know it's trying to say like oh the modern world is is without any kind of sense of virtue and masculinity and any everything it's just it's looking back to the wrong thing because it associates and this is a fault of a lot of you know this is where the church has gone the church has effeminized everything yeah you know yeah, litur- liturgy is very effeminate a lot of priests are very right. effeminate many catholic men are effeminate and right. men who are craving something masculine look at that and they say you know that's not for me and it must yeah. be christianity's fault that that's the case so let me go to something manly where you can th- chuck a spear through someone's chest. And it's like, you know, back yeah. in the old days, Christians it's, chucked spears through people's chests when they needed to do. Because, but that's not the point of it, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's such a push. Like, uh, you know, the pendulum swings so yeah. hard, right? Yeah. You, you, yeah. On one hand of the spectrum, you get the the femme uh, man who wears the, the, the low, low-cut uh, sweater at uh, Starbucks with his <laughs> facial tattoos and piercings and you know in, in his skinny jeans and he's like oh i got the double cafe latte twist with no lime and no sugar can we just delete the cup and just go with the ring okay thanks you know um like you got that going for you and then the other side of that is yeah man i just got my new tactical uh vest my and my uh my plates with my new ar lowers and uppers which i built myself and i i pressed my own rounds and i got my tactical pants my tactical underwear my tactical hoodie in my tactical truck like wh- why are you in the military? No. Are you SWAT team? No. no. Okay. So why does everything need to be tactical one more time? I just need to know how to shoot. That's it. it's just got to know how to shoot and then have enough rounds. That's it. Okay. You know. So it's like there's like these extremes. Like everything Navy SEAL, SEAL Team Six, or everything you know trans or whatever. It's like the the middle ground is the answer. You know, men have to lead, protect, provide. So they have to be. They have to. You know, they keep themselves in shape. Like I was overweight for decades. I had my at my worst, I was four hundred and six like four hundred and sixty pounds at the peak of my obesity. 
And that was a that was a byproduct of depression. Mm -hmm. That was a byproduct of pornography addiction. And that was a byproduct of committing the mortal sin of abortion, which put me into a suicidal thought, which I share in my documentary film, The Other Side of Fear. Um, coming down from that was was a long, hard slog. I lost 150 pounds just in the last you know couple of years, but um, but that but why do we keep ourselves in shape? Is it because we we want to be we want to be like Rambo? We want to be SEAL Team Six? We want to be Terminator? The Terminator list? Chris Pine? You know, or Pratt? <laughs> what what is his name? Pratt? Chris Pratt. Um, and you know Chris what I mean? Pine like is also we, one, but yeah. Like uh, and back in my day, it would have been Charlie Sheen. Anyway, um, you know that's that's not the answer. We, we keep ourselves in good physical condition so that we can serve the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all that he wishes us to do, so that we can tend the garden like Adam, so that we can care for our family and be the man on the porch who stands in the gap between our family and danger in the world, uh, so that we can be the, the door through which, through which anything comes or goes when it comes to our family, like our Lord is to us, we must be to our family. So what does it take to achieve that? Well, it takes, you know, it takes our determination to to be the leader, protector, and provider. It doesn't necessarily mean I need tactical boots, right? Mm -hmm. But we live in a world where uh, a fold of Andrew Tate's and Chris Pratt's that make us feel otherwise. Like if I'm going to be cool, man, I'm going to need the latest sling technology for my, my AR. And uh, I mean, it, let's just be honest. Are you an AR guy or an AK guy? AR guys are more like the dude with the sweater and Starbucks. Just, <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. And I, and I'm not. I've got good friends that are that are into shooting, shooting sports. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. Going to ranges and shooting and getting precise at, or having a collection, or enjoying taking some tactical courses. I have no problem with any of that because some of that is necessary skills. Mm -hmm. But it's the culture around it that I have a problem with. Yeah. I have a problem with. Uh, with combat veterans uh, who write books and then movies and embellish the violence of the culture in which they had to subsist. You know, um, we men may be called to do violent things in defense of the innocent, but we shouldn't relish in it. It may have to be something we do, but we should never be grateful, glad, happy, joyful, gleeful about having to commit any violence whatsoever. We must be prepared to stand in the gap for the innocent, but we must not relish in it. And we live in and breathe in a culture that does. So I see both sides of that spectrum and I go, there's a problem here. We're not seeing the middle ground. The middle ground is to be a, uh, to be a man fully alive, a man ready and capable to do, uh, to do the will of God whenever it is uh, thrust upon him to do so. And to, um, and to you know live your life in preparation for that. But not to go to not to go to one extreme or the other. But I do see that everywhere. Was it was it Tolkien who said, uh, "The warrior does not love the 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 sword for its brightness, but uh, for that which it protects." Something along those lines. Mm. That's so. That, you, so so you're trying to make up for quoting C.S. Lewis. I think they go like hand in hand. I mean, Tolkien they they, li they literally walked. I see where you're going talk, with this. They literally walked and talked don't, together. And, don't think I don't know. And disagreed okay. vehemently over whether it was dwarfs or dwarves. Yeah, things like Tolkien that. Tolkien died not talking to Lewis because Lewis was a stubborn <laughs> person who refused to convert to the one holy Catholic and apostolic yeah, church. And guess what it was? It was because of a woman. Because of, of a woman. I'm not saying women are the cause of all the problems in the world. <laughs> uh oh, Joe, you're you're becoming a. You're becoming an MGTOW. But I'm saying what what I'm saying is uh, <laughs> Eve ate the fruit. I'm te it's a joke. It's a joke. I'm teasing. Don't stop. I can see you texting my wife right now. Stop yeah. it. Don't tell my wife I said there, that. There, there's, there is a point to be made about, you know, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard for someone to take responsibility when they don't have any authority, when their authority has been taken well, away. Well, okay. You know? that's, I I, that's, my, yeah. It's not an excuse, but what I'm saying is like this is, this is part of the thing is that men have to – and this is, again, where the diagnosis is correct and where you, ha you have to – you can't just be a, 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 a pushover, you know? You can't just be a, a wimp and a simp and a loser and, and like, oh, well, I'm supposed to be humble, and that means, like, uh, standing here, you know? 
you can't just stand in front of your family. Sometimes you have to actually go out and charge forward, especially if you don't have a family yet or, yeah. or aren't called to have one. That you yeah. need, you need to charge forward and you need to you need to take back some of the authority so that you can take responsibility. The responsibility that you're that you're supposed to have, yeah. like that's you know the, that's you know the reason too. you just said something that triggered me, and uh, I can say that because all the cool kids say that. <laughs> I, I am I feel I am feeling you've, so triggered you've right been now. Triggered? I'm I'm just gonna go to my safe space right now because you just triggered me. Okay, you just triggered me. <sighs> can I, I just need a candle. Can we light a candle somehow? This just need to just feel Can, really. Joe, like candles peace. produce CO two. We're not allowed to <gasps> light candles anymore. Oh! It'll increase our carbon well, footprint. LED candle. It's got to, it's got to be an LED candle. candle made with a battery that's made from lithium that's mined by children in China. <laughs> that's more environmentally conscious. So environmentally conscious. Okay, uh, muscle memory is the name of my. Bo- I'm plugging my book. I'm gra- <laughs> grifting my book <laughs> all, yet this again. Is all just so joke and grift. <laughs> Please do not buy my book. It's the Whatever grift that keeps you do, on grifting. I am not selling the book. I've just you triggered me, so I had to bring it up. Why I start the book off? This spoil. I'm giving you spoilers so you don't buy the book. Okay, so stop it. Don't buy the book. I start the book off telling a story about when I was in the Marine Corps, and the reason why it's called Muscle Memory, which I got a lot of, I I took a lot of flack for calling my book on pornography Muscle Memory. By the way, you can read between the lines. Um, but I tell a story of when I was in the Marine Corps, leading a patrol on uh, Seek and Destroy. And uh, we, we got set up for an ambush. And as uh, as our enemy entered the kill zone, you know, I gave the command to open fire. And no sooner than we started, you know, laying rounds down on the target, we started to take fire from our six. And I turn, I swivel my head around, and I see that there was automatic weapons fire coming from about uh, maybe 60 yards or so away from like a, a ditch or a gully. And, uh, you know, the Marine Corps... The Marine Corps trains you on what to do in those circumstances. So, and I'm not giving, I'm not touting myself here. I'm not, I'm really not. The punchline will come in a minute. It's a spoiler alert. But there's only one thing you can do. There's only, you only really have one real option in that circumstance. And you have to fight yourself over it the war is really with yourself it's not with your enemy at that point because the internally your your instinct is to hug the ground but there was no there was no cover and concealment where we were we were out we were kind of in the open so there was no cover and concealment so there was nowhere to run to to hide from the bullets coming down range so you got one choice when that happens and so i swiveled about and i yelled out Contact six o'clock, get online, assault through, get online, assault through. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to stand up. You're supposed to form a line and then you all attack that one point all at the same time with as, as intense firepower as you possibly can muster. And so I yelled it out. Contact six o'clock, get online, assault through, get online, assault through. And uh, I swiveled about and men on my right and my left were hugging the dirt. They were hugging the dirt. And so I reached down and I grabbed this, this one guy next to me by the belt, uh, by his back belt, and I hauled him to his feet and I pushed him towards the muzzle fire. And then I called out for, for uh, two Marines on my, on my right to flank. And I tried to push my men forward towards those muzzle flashes. Now, here's the punchline. And this is, to be honest with you, I, I used to tell this story all the time when I gave talks, especially to men, because it's the way I tell it, it's a gripping story. But I feel horribly guilty for telling this story, so I don't do it anymore. Here's the punchline We were at Camp Pendleton on a mountainside playing war games with blanks. That's why I don't like telling a story, because I feel like I'm stealing from combat veterans who actually have been in the <laughs> line of fire, have given their lives, or had buddies die, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, I always feel guilty about about telling a story because I will only tell it in a dramatic way. So I don't do it anymore. I'm, t- I'm sharing with you because I'm trying to make a point that, Jake, you just made. I think it was brilliant. And that is we can only charge. We can only assault the enemy with as much ferocity as possible when we are being assaulted and our life is on the line. You must counterattack with more violence than the enemy is going to bring to you. Now, here's the 
the real kicker, the real punchline was that that was a, a training exercise in Camp Pendleton. And the guy next to me was hugging the ground. The bullets weren't real. <laughs> no one died that day. Yet the scenario was real enough in his mind. Mm -hmm. The intensity of it was real enough in his mind that he hugged the earth. That was his instinct to do so. That's why I say I don't give myself credit because it was easy to do the thing that you're trained to do when you know you're not going to die. <laughs> it's easy to stand up and face the muzzle flashes of an M60 uh, just 60 yards away pointing at you. It's super easy to do the right thing when there's no chance that you're ever going to get hit by a bullet and die. Like, pff, yeah, congratulations me for, for looking like the Rambo there. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but that guy, the intensity of the situation was just enough for that guy to, to lose the battle from within, and that was to hug the earth. Now, if real bullets would have been flying, I probably would have been just like that guy. Probably. By the grace of God, I've never been shot at in anger. So uh, I, I consider myself very blessed that way. But um, I think you were right. I think what you said that triggered me is spot on. And that's why, and that is, that is the entire reason why I felt I needed to write this book rather than just continue to tell my story was because I needed men, knuckleheads in particular, to know that very fact that when you are, when you are struggling with your addiction, pornography, let's just say alcohol, whatever it may be, you are in a fight to the death. The enemy has closed on you and you are surrounded and you are now in a fight to the, to the death. It is mortal combat and you have but one choice, one choice only, and that is to get online and assault through. You must overwhelm your enemy with a superior form of violence. And what is your form of violence? That's the other thing I talk about in my book. It is... It is the sacraments and the sacramental graces that you are given, that you have access to. Couple that with proper theology. Couple that with uh, healing your brain. And you are going to have a powerful opportunity. And the claim that I make is this book, for anybody who's addicted to pornography or addictions, really could be any addiction. You just insert your addiction in, instead of pornography, which was mine. Um I will guarantee that this technique works 100% of every time that you use it without fail, 100%. Now, it's easy for me to say because I had a miraculous healing that changed everything in my life. So it's a lot. I would argue that it is harder for men who haven't had that same grace. But I do believe in what I wrote in that book back in 2014. It's that old. You Were you even born in 2014, Jake? I was that was around that time. Yeah, were you around that time? <laughs> I was. <laughs> I was like, I was like I was like nineteen, twenty in twenty fourteen. You were that old? I was like nineteen. Yeah. You are an old man. You're I, not I as know, young I'm, as I I'm, thought I'm, you are. I, you I'm, are I'm, what? I'm gonna be twenty nine this year. Yeah. Though. Oh my heavens! I'm glad you're sitting down. You could break a hip. <laughs> I know. This is, Your life is <laughs> over. This is why it's funny that I'm the I'm the Gen Z defender on this show because I'm really just I'm really a millennial. <laughs> I'm an old person. You are old. <laughs> I thought you were way younger. I really did. You are pretty old. I'm Holy the old smoke. man in the studio here with all my all my fellow <sighs> young producers. <laughs> Twenty nine. Practically ancient. Please pray for Jake's hips. <laughs> He's going to need a walker soon. I did just go to the chiropractor yesterday, and there were some noises. There were, some uh, noises. There were noises. Caleb the Mechanic. That's the mindset that keeps you from freezing in combat. Get online and assault through. By the way, one of the best depictions on film of that get online assault through theology, Tears of the Sun with John McClane from Die Hard. There's a scene there. They're ambushed. What do they do? They get online and they assault through. Man, it's so good. I saw that and I'm like, tear, weep. So good. Sharon, you're amazing. God bless you. Sci-Fi Mike, I, I love you, brother. God bless you all. We'll see you back here tomorrow.